In this presentation, I'd like to talk about using system subcooling and superheat as a method to determine whether or not you have a correct charge within the unit. It can also be used as a tool for troubleshooting refrigerant side problems within an air conditioning system. Now you may have noticed in my previous presentations I had always used design conditions. Pretty much design conditions are the conditions at which the equipment is tested to ensure that the BTU ratings and system performance is what the manufacturer states they are. Now, I always use 95 degrees outdoor temperature, always use 75 degrees indoor temperature. But the fact is, seldom is it always 95 degrees outside, and seldom is it always 75 within the customer's house. For one thing, they didn't call you out there because it was nice and cool inside. It's usually a malfunction going on within the equipment that's causing the home to not cool correctly. So here we are. We're going to take a look at the subcooling and superheat as it applies to other than design conditions to determine the correct charge. This is often called a superheat and subcooling chart. First off, I'd like to address the subcooling. The subcooling charging method is only used on thermostatic expansion valves. This will apply to both 410A and R22 systems. And our subcooling is defined as the temperature of a liquid refrigerant when it's cooled below its condensing temperature. So let me use our previous example here. Here's our refrigerant condensing back into a liquid. Somewhere about, let's say right here in the system, we have no more vapor and the refrigerant takes on sensible heat below the condensing temperature. A properly charged system on a 95 degree day would give us 20 degrees of uh, subcooling. But here's where the, the thing about the thermostatic expansion valves come in. If this system is overcharged, we will have excessive subcooling. So our thermostatic expansion valve maintains a constant 12 degree superheat. So any extra refrigerant in this system will back up in the condenser. So we've got it, let's say for instance, we have an overcharge. Now we have a pure liquid at this point in the system it takes on extra subcooling so that when I get to my uh, liquid line leaving the condenser instead of having a hundred degrees I may have significantly less than that I would have an increase in subcooling because the refrigerant has had more of the circuit to reject sensible heat. According to our chart here, from the unit nameplate or literature, they tell us that an average subcooling here typically is 8 to 12 degrees. Depending on which book you pick up, it may be as high as 20. Measure our liquid pressure and convert to temperature. That's what we've done right here. Subtract the required subcooling. 
This is the required liquid line temperature. Measure liquid line temperature. If the measured liquid line temperature does not equal the required liquid line temperature, add refrigerant to lower the temperature. Remove refrigerant to raise the temperature. Most cases, they would allow you as much as plus or minus three degrees Fahrenheit to, to adjust the charge to a uh, normal subcooling. Again, for TXV expansion valves. Our second chart is a little more complicated. This is the superheat charging chart for non-TXV 410A and R22 systems. Our example that we used earlier was for a fixed orifice R22 system. With this type of system, system pressures on the high side dictate how much refrigerant is fed to our evaporator. If we have a high superheat, that means that the refrigerant boiled to a pure vapor much earlier in the system than we would have expected it to. So now we can take on sensible heat through a larger section of the evaporator. Instead of 12 degrees of superheat, we may in some cases have 20, 25. Now, unlike with our subcooling, the outdoor conditions and the indoor conditions have a much greater effect on how much refrigerant is fed to the system. In other words, a correct charge may in fact have 15 degrees of superheat, 18 degrees of superheat, 20 or more. So let's go back and take a look here at just how to calculate this. Here's our superheat charging chart. We we'll use this again to determine if we have a correct charge in the system. Some people may use these charts to actually charge the equipment with. Uh, I found that to be very time consuming and really the way to charge a unit is charge it by the weight of the refrigerant. But let's take a look at this chart. We have to take some readings to determine what would be a correct superheat for the ambient conditions. We have an indoor entering wet bulb temperature. You would use some type of psychrometer to determine what our wet bulb temperature is within the structure. The wet bulb temperature is largely dictated by the amount of humidity in the air, a combination of humidity and room temperature. We would also have to get our condenser entering air dry bulb temperature, and our dry bulb temperature is a sensible temperature of the outdoor air. So let's, let's take a look at this. If we have 64 degrees entering wet bulb temperature. That's entering the, our evaporator, it's entering our return inside the house. And we have an outdoor temperature of 80 degrees. We would expect to have a measured superheat of 15. These conditions vary. As the conditions vary, the superheat reading will also vary. So let's take a look at another example here. 
this would be more in line with a house that you've come to that the unit has been off for a while we have a high humidity inside the house we have a measured entering wet bulb temperature of 70 degrees we go outside and measure the outdoor conditions it's 85 degrees outside we make our repair we charge the unit up we start the unit and we need to be aware that this is not going to be generating 12 degrees of superheat at this point we find from our superheat chart that 22 degrees would be an acceptable superheat under these conditions The greater the load on a fixed orifice metering device, the higher the superheat. Now, if we follow our steps here, measure the outdoor air dry bulb, measure the indoor wet bulb, find the required superheat from chart, measure our suction pressure, convert the temperature, Add the required superheat to the converted temperature. Measure suction line temperature. If the line temperature does not equal the required suction line temperature, add refrigerant to lower the line temperature. Remove refrigerant to raise the line temperature. And they give us a rather large swing here of plus or minus 5 degrees to be able to allow for a tolerance. Uh, and when they say tolerance, you know, we a lot of times these systems may have dirty evaporators, they may have dirty condenser coils, and this will give us a, uh, a little leeway, a little gray area to get the charge correct. Again, this is the subcooling and superheat charging charts. To determine correct um, refrigerant charge. I hope this has been of use to you. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.